My name is Leah Brodsky. I'm a senior here in Applied Economics, and I want to tell you guys a little trip I took this January. So, you're standing at 19,000 feet above sea level, staring at the most beautiful sunrise you've ever seen in your life after spending seven hours hiking through the dead cold to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, to the rooftop of Africa. You're looking around at the beautiful chaos that is Uhuru Peak, at the people, at the snow that was still left, and thinking, my God, we did it. Now, before I tell you who we are and why we did it, let me go back to the genesis of this idea and the six months that it took to get us to here. This summer, I was lucky enough to spend interning in Sydney, Australia, and I was thinking about how to best use the Quinault Tradition Fellowship that I had received, which is a great program, by the way, and I was looking around different places to uh, better or to best use the resources to help improve the world, and I had an epiphany. I was sitting at work, a little bit bored, and I was searching through the Cornell World Changers Ning Network, which I highly recommend you all check out, when I saw this. Seth Cochran, with Trek at Kilimanjaro, alone raises funds for cleft lip surgeries in developing countries. And it just hit me like a lightning bolt. I knew this was something I had to do. I still remember the chill that I felt as I was reading this article about Seth, who uh, graduated from accounting engineering in 2001, um, climbed Kilimanjaro in 2007, and raised $40,000 for cleft sur lip surgery all by himself. And I was sitting there reading this, and then it just, it was, there wasn't a question in my mind that I had to do it. So I emailed Seth, and five minutes later he got back to me, and the next day we Skyped. Yeah, he was in Berlin and I was in Sydney. Um, that conversation has got, become one of many, but uh, we talked about his climb, what I want to do, and we decided to open up to other people. And instead of raising money for cleft lip surgery, we decided to raise money for an organization that he now started. After spending time in Africa, Seth realized that there was a condition that wasn't really being addressed by the international community, and that is obstetric fistula. Um, the most devastating problem you've never heard of, because show of hands, how many people here have heard of it before? Hey, good job, maybe I'm doing something right. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, I mean. um, <laughs> But at the time, I never heard of it before, and when I did, I was astonished to hear that it, um, it was allowed to happen. For those of you who don't know, it's a lesion that occurs during child labor that makes a woman can't control her bowels and is a taunt for the rest of her life. And it can be cured for a simple $250 surgery, which is successful 90% of the time. And so Seth went on to start operation.of.org, and I figured, why not raise money for this charity? So I got started. Um, <laughs> told all my friends that I was going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro for charity. Everyone told, said, you know, that's cool, go do it, or are you crazy, what are you talking about? But uh, when I got to Cornell, which was the platform, the launching platform for this idea, I spammed listservs, Facebook, went to Clubfest, and talked to every single person who had a pulse about this idea, and wanted to see if they wanted to come with me. Because I figured the more people were there, the more people could raise money for charity, and the more people would know about this, the more people would help. Um, just a funny story that happened to me when I was at Clubfest, I didn't really know what, probably what I was doing was right, I was kind of unsure, you know, it was the first time to do something like this, and I was talking to somebody about this idea when another friend of hers approached and started listening to our conversation. And the moment he heard me say Kilimanjaro, he turned to me and said, you know, you should talk to that other guy who's climbing up Kilimanjaro for charity, he should help you out if you want to do something like that. And I kind of turned to him and said, that's me. So it was kind of cool seeing someone uh, or hearing about your idea. So. From there, uh, a group started to form, and uh, <laughs> we, we decided to raise awareness on campus by selling brownies. Uh, this is us in Man, Man Lobby yelling, have you heard of such a fish show before? To the innocent <laughs> onlookers who walked by. Um, we actually, Rossi is sitting right there, so uh, <laughs> um, So we had a club, and um, we started raising money. We raised about $500 with brownies, but uh, we also had a date auction where we sold our, ourselves. <laughs> for charity to help cover our funds. And the way we, we wanted to fundraise was all the direct donations that people gave would go directly to Operation OS. So 100% of that money would go up towards helping women, but if anybody bought a service like a brownie or a date or whatever else from us, uh, we also had a fundraiser at our bar, they, that money would go towards covering our costs. So we wanted to cover our costs 100% on our own so when the money 
was do donated on people's behalf, that would go towards the charity. So fast forward four months, tons of emails, phone calls, uh, presentations, and here we are standing at Dubai Airport ready to fly into Dar es Salaam. Uh, it's me in the white shirt and the rest of the guys. It's a picture I took on my cell phone, so it's not that high quality. Um, I guess at this point, we were jumping into the deep end and getting ready to learn how to swim. None of us had ever been to Africa before, um, other than Nina, who's on this picture. Um, but she left when she was really young. And we, we were all college students. But the oldest person was 27, and she was an alumnus here. Um, but everyone else was between the ages of 19 to 21, 22. Um, so <laughs> it was going to be an interesting experience. So when we got to Africa, we actually went to Arusha, which is the town that uh, the guy who built the windmill, William, uh, was speaking at his first TED conference. We went to Arusha Medical uh, Hospital to learn how to uh, about about the conditions. And this is us talking to one of the OBGYNs, um, who's telling us about whoa, 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 what happened? I didn't, I didn't do that. You guys tell me. Okay, here we go. Got it. Thank you. So uh, the hospitals. Um, when we got to Arusha, we, we were lucky enough to visit two hospitals, and here we are. Um, this is a picture of a lady who uh, is only 16, and she has an obstetric fistula because she uh, didn't have the necessary equipment to give birth. Um, it was really hard being in the room with someone like that, um, especially because there were so many of us and one of her, and we spent so much time thinking, imagining, hoping that it would be you know, a good situation when we were there, we'd be there to help, but I couldn't help but feel like we were just intruders almost in the hospital, and I can't look at this picture without getting that sick feeling of not knowing what to do or what to say to make the person's life better, but knowing that you're kind of trying to do something in the right direction. So uh, the one, <coughs> one phrase that I'll never forget was one of the ladies who works there said, this is one of the better hospitals in Africa. Everybody has their own bed. Um, and that's going to stay with me forever, and I hope to kind of give you a shot of how, what the conditions were there. Um, so, moving on. So after the hospitals, we kind of saw what we were there for, and that this really was a problem, and it was real. Um, we started with the climb. And uh, it was a seven-day trek up the Mashame route um, of Kilimanjaro, and here we are at the gate with the things to remember, such as drink water and juice, uh, lots of water, and... Uh, not to, go, not to go fast, pull it, pull it. So here we are starting to get ready to climb the mountain. On the first day, we climbed through the rainforest. That's Emmanuel, our, uh, our, our, our guide. Each one of us had a guide and three porters with us, so there were actually about 33 locals helping a group of 11 people go up the mountain, which is surprising. You wouldn't think that it takes so many people, but you need porters, carry other stuff, uh, cooks. We actually had a waiter, which is nice. <laughs> This is us after the first day, about 3,930 uh, meters above sea level after the first day. Everything, everyone's happy, not, not too much uh, drama. We have to walk through a lot of rain, but uh, you can see one of our porters there on the side, and everybody is uh, gathering around the sign. Um, this is another picture of the porter. I wanted to put this one up there because it's pretty cool how they carry your stuff up the mountain. Because you have to have seven days worth of clothes, and food, and tents, and you name it, water pumps, um, utensils, all these things, and plus your own the jackets, because you do go through uh, quite a bit array of different um, environments, from the rainforest up to the, to the summit, it gets a lot colder. So here you can see one of the many porters who was on the mountain carrying uh, equipment on his head, which was really impressive. They didn't even have poles, and going twice as fast as we were. So they were really good shape, and we were not. Um, here you can see some of the emotions that you experience on the mountain. Um, seven days without modern technology uh, makes you do some funny things. That's me and my friend Kevin <laughs> uh, making fools of ourselves, and that's John, uh, who's actually the president of ISEC, which is a great organization, and he was also my roommate. Um, thoroughly exhausted after a long day's hike. Um, so. Here we have a first glimpse of the summit, and uh, so the Baraku camp on the fourth day. By this time, you're exhausted completely and just want to sleep and eat. As much as you can see, these are our modest tents which we slept in, um, dwarfed by the enormity that is Mount Kilimanjaro. And so, on the last day, it's different from all of them because you hike for three hours in the morning and then you sleep 
um, for, from then to lunch, and then from lunch to dinner, you sleep again, eat dinner, wake up, and sleep with, or sorry, eat dinner, go back to sleep until 11. And the reason you have to sleep so much is because on the last night, you have to hike through the night from 11 to 6 a.m. when you reach the summit. So this is the picture we took during dinner time, and by this time, we were around 15,000 feet above sea level, literally above the clouds, as you can see here. It was breathtaking. So that uh, night I'll never forget, January, uh, the night of January 15th, we got all our headlamps together, you know, had our final team meeting, and headed out into the darkness. All you could see for about six hours was a snake-like uh, snake line of uh, headlamps of, as other people, other fellow climbers, would be either behind you or above you. And I remember one point I was so exhausted that all I could do was count the amount of steps I was taking and then rest for five seconds. So it takes 10 steps and rest for five seconds and keep bumping the person ahead of me. Um, it's just a delirious confusion state that you know you have to keep going because you want to make the top, but you're not sure if you're going to get mountain sickness or what's going to happen. So all you see is this until... Uh, well, <laughs> here's an example of things that happen. Uh, it's Kirsty and Amy falling asleep um, during the climb, one of our breaks. All you see is this. Uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, the, the sun that comes up, and it's just a feeling like it's relief, joy, and just such delusion at the altitude that you don't really know what's going on, but you know that you're doing something right. And the light comes back, and it's just beautiful up there. So here's a picture of some of the snow and us at the top. So we made it. Nine of us made it. Two of us, unfortunately, did not. Um, but nine of us made it to the top of the mountain. And uh, I remember by the time I got there, some of the girls said that I was so out of it that my lips were black and there were spots on my face and everybody was just trying to get a picture at the top and it was so chaotic but um, definitely a moment I'll never forget. So we got to the bottom of the climb and here we are with all our porters and guys, uh, last picture uh, before we got off the mountain. So the reason I want to talk, share this journey with you guys is that there really isn't anything different about our group and us or anything that we did from any of you. Uh, we just saw an idea by someone who inspired us and we built upon it. And we had an amazing time doing it and changed the lives of 32 women, hopefully more to come, uh, who had such a fistula. And so what I want to say to you is, which one of you will be next? And why not you? Why, why can't you be the ones who have that moment of epiphany and go out and change the world? Thank you.